Welcome to the Market Huddle Plus. I'm Kevin Muir, and we have the great pleasure to welcome back to the show Will Thompson from Massive Capital. Will, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me again. It's always great to uh, join your uh, your show. I, I feel like the timing couldn't be better. Uh, you guys specialize in materials, energy, and industrials. Those three uh, sectors had a little bit of trouble last year, but since the start of this year, they've had a bid. Do you think this uh, rallies for real and the start of something bigger? Um, well, I, I certainly hope so. And I, I, I definitely think there are some some green shoots in a couple of places that we can look to to suggest that you know maybe there's a, a, a turn in the cycle that will favor uh, energy and commodities. Um, sort of most prominent, I think, sort of stat to look at would be sort of global manufacturing PMIs kind of look like maybe they've bottomed and are turning back up. Uh, that's usually a good sign for industrial metals use. I think that energy and materials in general continue to be quite tight. If you look at sort of inventories um, or stocks, uh, sort of across the commodity uh, spectrum, everything seems to be tight. Uh, prices, despite some of the trouble last year and the sort of drumbeat of of possible recession, which we've had for quite a few years now, um, you know, prices have still sort of held up and are you know sort of trading in in range bound fashion. Um, the most prominent, of course, being sort of oil in that sort of seventy to ninety range. Do you, I? I don't mean to interrupt here, but do you think that the threat of recession is what's held back a lot of these stocks? I think it's held back. I I do. Yeah. I yeah. And and, and would you go even further? Do you, would you argue? Like I might even say that it's held back the economy, meaning that a lot of CEOs have held back on capex because you know they kept thinking, oh, the recession's coming, the recession's coming. I'm not going to do anything. And if so, what do you think the trigger was? The finally Powell saying, I'm done. This is the tops in and rates. So I, I think I think you're spot on. I think a lot of CEOs did hold back. I think the combination of the interest rate hike followed by, if you will, concerns about the market, you know, you, you sort of have a double whammy there in terms of capex. Um, right. Everybody gets a little, you know, sort of gun shy with needing to borrow money because rates are now high. Um, and then you get the economy. I think the trigger, you know, I mean, a lot of people talk about catalysts and obviously catalysts, sometimes you can really identify them. Uh, in this case, I'm not sure I could really identify or pinpoint one sort of thing that resulted okay. in, in maybe a, a turn. I definitely believe that uh, central bank easing cycle, or at least the the idea that we, we might be entering one, definitely has changed the mood a little bit. Uh, there's no doubt that there are areas of the economy which still, especially in the United States or Europe, still appear uh, soft or or maybe the the news isn't so good, but there's also plenty of areas where there's a lot of strength. And so in that sort of confused environment uh, with the backdrop of a potential rate cut, I think a lot of people have probably sort of said, okay, we got to get back to business. Um, right. So. Now, a lot of people are focused on gold because it's running, but you're recently highlighting uh, the industrial metal, its cousin, let's say, copper. I'd love to hear your story because there, it's not something a lot of people are talking about. Everyone's focused on the other one. So I'd love to hear why you think that you're, you know copper might be something folks should look at. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no doubt that that gold is running and, and gold is an interesting story, um, but it, it does not have the same sort of economic underpinning, at least in my opinion, uh, that, that copper does. Um, and it's also, I think copper is a market that can and go on, go on a run that is uh, well sustained, and there's a lot of liquidity out there, so so you can really um, jump into that market, and a lot a lot of people can jump into that market at, at big scale. So there's an opportunity for real moves. I think the copper story is driven by acute sort of micro tightness, uh, supply issues, things of that nature occurring at the company level um, that are okay. quite positive uh, for copper. And then you've got this sort of favorable macroeconomic backdrop. 
And so, okay, why don't we start with that? Why don't we start with the big picture? And then after you can drill in on kind of what's happening on, at a company level, So big picture, what's the kind of positive secular story for owning copper? I think it's this sort of turning of the industrial cycle, which I had sort of mentioned before. You've got, again, those global manufacturing PMIs bottoming. You've got uh, the destocking um, from COVID has now worked its way through the system. And now you're starting to see sort of consumers of copper buy in the spot market, if you will, and and sort of uh, feed their businesses uh, hand to mouth. Um, And uh, on top of that, you sort of see the the general strength in the price, despite the fact that the Chinese real estate market and let's say the German manufacturing market uh, have been have been weak, and those are historically strong, you know, users of copper. Despite their weakness, uh, you still see otherwise sort of robust copper demand in the market, and so that macroeconomic picture is quite favorable. Within the context then of the the struggles uh, that individual companies are having supplying the market, um, and that underpinned by this sort of giant, I mean, a couple of things, a couple of themes, but there's a giant sort of government put on everything green related, and and despite the fact that maybe over the last year and a half, green any any sort of green stock has sort of gotten wiped out, solar, wind, etc. Uh, there's still a lot of government money flowing into those sectors, and that's especially in China, and that's driving huge uh, sort of copper demand. You're looking at growth in China of sort of five to six percent this year versus uh, seven to eight percent last year. So very healthy. You're looking at sort of U.S. copper demand growth of three to four percent this year. The United States is driven by both that green demand, but also AI data center demand. So you're starting to touch like a lot of big themes. Um, And when you've got sort of all these big narratives feeding in, into and through this copper, we'll call it a copper bottleneck uh, because they all need copper. um, There's quite a favorable sort of backdrop. Um, So You mentioned German manufacturing. I didn't actually realize that that's a big driver of the copper price. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, if you look at, say, German manufacturing and then, you know, sort of things like Korean uh, manufacturing, you know, they produce a lot of uh, durable goods. Uh, They produce a lot of copper intensive uh, machinery and equipment. Um, And so just as if you sort of put together a playbook, if you will, what what do I want to keep my eye on when I'm tracking copper prices? You know, the Chinese property market has always been part of it. For me, German manufacturing, Korean manufacturing. Um, and you know now over the last couple of years, of course, you add in sort of various types of green demand, and those are are starting to be some of the demand drivers that you would want to keep track of, at least in my opinion. Right, and 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 the argument being that we've kind of experienced, although the U.S. Uh, economy has been doing well, the rest of the world has been in a lull, let's say, and yet we still, even with this economic lull. We have seen copper hanging in there in price. So the argument being that if we do get central bank easing in a global economic uptick, we add that demand to the already kind of tight market and copper heads higher. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, every time I look at the story and the situation, I always just sort of assume sort of stagnant demand. Okay. Um, or flat demand. And, you know, within that context, the supply picture becomes problematic you start layering in a more positive macroeconomic backdrop and you start thinking about what some positive demand inflection might be. And it it really can start to look like quite a rosy picture. Um, You mentioned some micro problems that like or micro supply problems. Is that with specific companies and could you expand and explain that? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's obviously some, some well-known cases of mine closures uh, or or production shortfalls at say uh, Cobra in, in Panama, first Quantum's mine being shut down, um, but we're also seeing sort of the drought in Chile and Africa starting to impact uh, supply. Uh, power in Zambia is impacting supply out of uh, Africa, specifically the DRC and and Zambia. Zambia also is a giant supplier of acid into the DRC's production. So there's starting to be sort of bottlenecks, if you will, uh, throughout some of the critical uh, producing countries. LATAM production in sort of the first quarter in Peru and Chile was quite weak. Uh, And then what's also happening now is that a lot of mines 
that produced concentrate are failing to sort of grow that concentrate delivery into the smelting system that's been built up in China. And so you've got a lot of smelter capacity in China producing refined copper uh, that just can't operate at full capacity. Um, And so what we're starting to see is refinement and treatment charges come down. And those are the charges that the copper smelters charge to the the mining firms to to, uh, refine their concentrate into copper. Um, And you'll start to see some of that capacity come offline. uh, And you'll start to see some of those smelters limit the refined production of copper uh, throughout the rest of the year as they sort of husband their their limited supply of concentrate. And so you've got uh, copper out of the mines uh, being challenged. You have concentrate production out of the mines being challenged. And then further down the supply line, supply chain, you have the refined copper production, you know, sort of facing challenges. So you've got supply challenges sort of across the board. And is this a function of us just not, you know, spending enough CapEx over the last five, 10 years? I, I always hesitate to sort of like toss one variable out there. As okay. Cause yeah, variable, obviously pa- the- I have to say that, I mean, if any scenario comes close, this is, this is it. Um, that failure to invest, I mean, that's driven by multiple issues, but, um, the failure to invest, the failure to find new assets, um, it's, it's coming back to bite us. And I, I think it's coming back to bite us. Uh, in multiple commodities, but but copper just sort of being such a big uh, a big industrial sort of demand metal, it's it's coming back to bite as bad. I mean, the perfect example I think is um, we have a mine in the United States or a potential mine in the United States, and I've used this example before in places called Resolute. It's a joint project by BHP and Rio Tinto. Um, that mine of itself, they've invested two billion dollars in. That mine of itself could produce 25% of U.S. copper demand for the next 40 years, okay? They have been trying to get that thing through permitting for something like 15 years. Um, <laughs> and again, is, is that true? Like, honestly, like, is 15 yeah, years they've been trying to get permitted? Well, it's, it's either 10 years or 15 years. I don't yes. remember which it it's is. It's more than a decade. Um, it's, more, it's more than a decade. They've invested $2 billion dollars. Um, at this point, more than $2 billion. And they just, they just can't get the permits done. Um, And yeah, you're talking about, you know, you want to talk about strategic value, 25% of the U S copper demand for 40 years, man, that's, that's a, that's a, a a serious sort of competitive advantage, if you will, versus other countries in, in some sort of weird geopolitical way. Right. Um, But that's a, that's a huge contributor and and that type of issue you've got that type of issue and then you have the failure to find you know other big deposits uh, there haven't been that many what one might call tier 1 deposits brought online recently you've got robert friedland's uh, uh kamoa kakula mine down in the drc that would be a tier 1 mine which is going to be something in the you know bottom of the cost quartile uh, bottom cost quartile and you know, top production quartile, if you will, uh, the OT mine in Mongolia. And, and that's really it since like the mid 1980s or something. Um, <laughs> isn't, they, it, isn't it ironic that they're making this big move to green and then they're hampering the supply of the stuff that they need to, to go green? Well, nobody is, is more, uh, of a, of a hypocrite, if you will, almost than, um, Western, energy policy people in regards to that issue. It's, uh, it's, you know, we want to produce certain things here, but we don't want to produce the inputs. Right. So now I, I know that you're more of a company fellow and that you're analyzing companies and, and you're, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you're just saying, I think copper's headed higher. So therefore I'm going to buy companies X, Y, Z. And we can talk about those X, Y, Z's. But in the meantime, before that, can I pin you down in just something of an expectation about copper? Like, could you see us trading six bucks a year from now? We're currently four. Um, Is that? Yeah. I mean, I I don't think that that doesn't sound ridiculous to me. Yeah. Okay, so you're um, like at that I, level yeah, bullish. It's not, it's not. It doesn't tend to be the way I work, and I tend to get directionality right. But 
Right. Okay. Fair enough. I completely get that. I'm just trying to understand. No, I I don't think $6 sounds egregious or outrageous by any means. I mean, you, there was, um, just to give you a a sort of a sense for the scale of the, the, the actual company level problems, the Freeport McMoran CEO, or or I guess he's now the former CEO and now he's just the chairman of the board, uh, Richard, um, I don't remember his last name. His last name is escaping me, but um, he's been there forever. Uh, He said at some point last year to an audience at a conference that he couldn't bring on a copper mine. And I think he said, and if he, if he had the go ahead today and had the asset, he couldn't bring on a copper mine in five years if it was trading at $8 a pound. Wow. Um, and, And, and I probably got that slightly wrong, but that was the gist of it. Right. Um, so you know, we're we're not only not necessarily near an incentive price to bring on copper supply, which I don't know if that's wholly true, uh, but it, it's sort of in some theoretical sense it might be true. But we're definitely right here at four dollar copper, not at a copper price that's got people rushing to find copper mines, despite the fact it looks like we need it. Got it. All right. So now, can you share with us any ways you're playing it? Yeah. So. I- as a, as a guy who sort of focuses on companies first, um, I tend to sort of focus on management teams first. I think, you know, in mining, especially the management team is critical because it's, it's a business where you are going to run into problems. And the question is, can the management team uh, sort of get you around those problems or solve those problems? It, it's not, you know, execution, you know, first off execution and getting it right the first time, that that's probably raises more red flags in my book for a mining firm than than them saying we're gonna be off on our timeline by a year. Um, right. so okay. management companies, you're suspicious if they actually fulfill it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so management teams first. And so from that perspective, you know, I, I would say that two companies stick out if you're looking for, say, a uh, a develop a, a, a producing copper miner who's got torque to the copper price um, and who is going to sort of move with the copper price, um, and you can feel comfortable owning even if you don't really know much about mining. And those would be uh, Robert Friedland's Ivanhoe uh, okay. and the Lundin family's Lundin Mining. Both have growth potential. Um, both have strong copper production. Uh, both have. Um, Great torque to the copper price, fantastic management teams, uh, and at least in the case of Ivanhoe, you get some added benefit of Robert Friedland, who uh, is going to pump the stock uh, and <laughs> about, about as well as anyone in the mining industry can do. Uh, People don't know this, or I, I, not everyone knows this. He actually roommate was his roommate in college was Steve Jobs, yeah, and he taught Steve Jobs how to actually sell. Well, that, that is, yeah, yeah. He was definitely Makes, a roommate. I, I, <laughs> I heard him say that he taught him and I'm always sort of lean back. I'm like, okay. I, <laughs> well, I remember the Glus- the guys, I think it's the guys at Gluskin Chef. They had a rule. They called it the, um, the Friedland rule. When they went and listened to him, there was a three day cooling yeah. off period before they were allowed to buy any stock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I had that experience recently because I went and I was at a conference and I saw him speak and he's got another company called Ivanhoe Electric, which has got some interesting development assets and some interesting technology assets associated with mining and is worth looking at. Um, but I, I, I don't know, it, it, nothing about it really attracted my attention when I looked at it and I just didn't feel the need to pull the trigger on it. Um, right. But after I saw him speak, I was sitting there, I was like, oh man, I, I really should buy some of this. <laughs> <laughs> you got to put the Friedland rule into effect. So that the symbol for those who want to look at this, unfortunately, they're both just trade in Canada. Mostly Ivanhoe is I V N. And then the Lundin family, that's a, a very famous uh, a Canadian family that has been in mining forever. Super nice people. Wonderful. Uh, on since the day is long. And they, uh, that, that stock is L U N. And that if, thing's just running. Yeah. If you want to go, a little more uh, sort of early stage, I think that the two assets that the Lundin family has in the Vacuna district, which is where the Lundin mining group also has an asset uh, and is this just extremely prospective um, 
sort of territory in Argentina that they've sort of got a lock on and which appears to have perhaps several tier one assets. I would look at uh, NGEX and Philo Mining. Again, lending family companies, they've got uh, BHP is invested in uh, Philo. Um, one of the Japanese trading firms is also invested in NGX. These are assets that they will develop and hopefully put into production over the next, say, 10 years. Uh, but they're very much more development and would require a sort of a higher risk appetite. But I, I think they're, you know, the next tier one assets that get turned on in the copper space. Right. So that's FIL for Philo and NGEX for the other one. And they're both Canadians. Well, we're going to have to make you an honorary Canadian with naming all these Canadian I, stocks. I, I end up with a lot of Canadian stocks in my portfolio. All yeah. right. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you recently wrote about dispersion of your, the results of, of the companies in your universe. And I thought it was really interesting because it wasn't actually what I expected when you, uh, explained it. So why don't you share with us uh, what you, what you found? Yeah. So, I, you know, my strategy, I've been up and running my strategy since 2019 and we had a great 2019, great 2020 great 2021 and then 2022 and 2023 I, I i struggled and i was down about six percent both years um and so this year when i sort of started out the year i was like i, I want to take a look at my sector and see if it's as sort of opportunity if there's as many opportunities there from a statistical perspective as i feel like there are from just sort of like my gut read on on you know the companies i look at and stuff like that and so i spent some time reviewing you know literature about how you might assess the breadth of opportunity uh one has in a stock universe and there's michael mubosin's written a couple of great pieces on it um and one of the things he suggests you do uh and this is important because you know it, it, if if you're going to allocate money to someone like me and pay me to manage money you want me to be managing your money in a in a game, if you will, where I you know have edge and the deployment of that edge, uh, uh, you know, can produce meaningful results. And and so that was sort of the question I was looking to answer. So our universe um, is energy, materials, and industrial companies with a market cap over two hundred million, trading across something like. I don't know, it's sort of two dozen or so global markets that our prime broker Goldman Sachs gives us access to, uh, or sort of ready, easy access to. Um, and what we found uh, in looking at the sort of 10 year historical dispersion of results for the companies underlying the universe. So basically, looking at the standard deviation of annualized returns for the stocks within the universe, uh, what we found is that, you know, the liquid real asset universe that we invest in has you know significant breadth of opportunity as measured by the dispersion of results and the dispersion of results you look at because you sort of say any place where the results are really tight it makes more sense just to buy an etf because creating differentiated returns that outperform gets really hard if all the companies just sort of track to one you know sort of one result but if you've got a lot of winners and a lot of losers you know, that's a game, if you will, where you want to sort of deploy edge and go after and sort of play from an active management perspective. Um, and what we found is that our universe, that real asset universe, again, it compares in terms of breadth of opportunity to sort of global or U.S. small cap. Um, so, you know, that's a good place to be sort of looking for companies to invest in. It is significantly better in terms of the breadth of results what uh in comparison to something like the s p 500 or the FTSE europe all cap index um and then if you just take it a step further and look at our different industries you actually you know the results are not are not terribly surprising if you think about it um oil and natural gas there are a lot of opportunities for picking stocks in oil and natural gas because there are a lot of winners and a lot of losers every single year um mining a lot of opportunities. Other materials, not nearly as many opportunities. Much harder to deploy edge, skill, and knowledge to create differentiated results 
uh, in the other materials, so chemicals, ag, things of that nature. Um, and then industrials and utilities, uh, other another place where it's it's more challenging. Industrials are better uh, than utilities, but utilities in our universe are at least the hardest place to deploy knowledge and edge and, and sort of uh, active management to generate differentiated returns. Um, but I think that the sort of the key takeaway is that over the last 10 years, uh, despite the fact that people have perhaps struggled to generate returns in uh, our sector, the spread of outcomes for the underlying companies has been broad enough uh, that the opportunity is comparable to U.S. small cap or global small cap. It's like, um, I'm sure you're too young for this, but uh, Maverick told Goose, this is a target rich environment. Yeah. And that's what yeah, exactly what it's like. And I was actually surprised because I thought, especially over the last couple of years, that that you would have seen the dispersion narrow as everyone did badly. But obviously, that's not the case. There's still winners in there. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I will say 20. Uh, let's see, just sort of looking at the numbers. Um, I mean, there definitely has been some narrowing, uh, but. Um, not, it's, you know, it's quite relative, if you will. Right. Um, it's not, it's not particularly dramatic. Uh, and th there are also some other interesting results in that we just sort of, because of how many stocks are in this universe, it's about 5,000 companies. Uh, we did divide it into two sort of sections, a, a small cap and a, and a, a large cap, what we called it, or a mid cap and a large cap. And okay. the, the small cap, mid cap has is, is got a $675 million market cap line. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at that part of the universe, that part of the universe, that index uh, has never in the last 10 years generated a positive annual return. So there are a lot of losers and some really big winners and not a lot in the middle if you're in that small cap. Within the large cap, it's it, you do generate uh, meaningful positive returns sort of almost every year. Um, but that small cap part of, or small mid cap part of the universe, uh, you know, massive asymmetries. Um, right. All you have to do is look at the Canadian Venture Exchange Index to know that, that result, which has been leaking forever. A lot of big winners or handful of big winners and a lot of losers. Right. So interesting place to be picking stocks, especially for someone like me who's long short. Okay. Now let's uh, finish up with uh, some down and out commodities that you think are interesting. And obviously the one that everyone has got to have on their screen, Nat Gas. What's going on there? And is there any way to play it? Yeah. So I, I think we're, Still early on Nat Gas, but I think Nat Gas, sort of as you suggested, uh, should be on everyone's radar. Um, and oh, here we go. Sorry. Uh, and um, you know, look, I think the long term outlook is still good. And in order for commodities to sort of set, uh, you know, have a good run in the long term, they need to have this sort of bottom cycle period where where there's some consolidation. Uh, maybe some assets shut down, things of that nature. But I think, you know, natural gas in the United States, uh, the long-term story, LNG, increased flows to Mexico, increased flows to Canada, and industrial production, those sort of pillars of the sort of macro story behind natural gas are still very much in place. And you still have intense consolidation uh, or concentration of the assets amongst a handful of companies in a couple of places. And those companies, Chesapeake, EQT, CNX, and others, um, are all sort of starting to shut in production a little bit. And then on top of that, you add sort of the geopolitical issues. And the geopolitical story, uh, I, I think, is still there. And it still favors uh, sort of higher... Uh, natural gas prices. You look at the Middle East, and you know, yesterday we had Israel, you know, shooting a missile at a Iranian, maybe I Iranian consulate slash embassy in Syria, and you know, so you're sort of like, okay, Syria, well, it's it's a bit of a war zone, so sort of anything goes. But you know, that's still a major escalation in the Middle East. Uh, you've got a lot of LNG coming out of the Middle East, um, and then you look at Europe and Ukraine and. You know, the attacks, I think, two weeks ago from Russia onto Ukrainian natural gas storage facilities 
Um, those facilities haven't been used this year. That's my understanding. They have natural gas in them, but they haven't been used. Uh, so Europe hasn't had to call on them. Um, but uh, they are very much part of uh, the, the sort of claimed high levels of storage that Europe has. So there's still very much a geopolitical story that favors uh, higher prices for nat gas, in my opinion, and then a domestic story here in the United States uh, that favors continued increased demand. We admittedly have a period of time here where due to weather, uh, or uh, in many ways due to weather, um, we are well supplied, but you know, uh, the wrong winter, uh, the wrong geopolitical events, um, and you know the story changes quite rapidly, and and so I I still think that natural gas I've got no natural gas investments at the moment uh, outside of Equinor, uh, which produces a lot of natural gas into Europe, uh, but the idea that uh, natural gas is going to hang out around here for a long time, I think is is probably a I, I'd like to take I like to take the other side of that bet. So okay, is there any other uh, down and out commodities you're looking at? Um. So, I mean, I, I've talked about lithium before with people, um, so I won't go into it sort of in depth here, but I think lithium is definitely down and out. I think a lot of battery metals are down and out. Um, some of the battery metal, metals are quite tricky to play, um, and you've got to find a good producer, but I think any, almost any battery metal at this point is definitely down, uh, whether it's you know, fully been sort of knocked out and has hit the bottom. I don't know, but cobalt probably has. Um, you know, there are other commodities like graphite, etc., that are used in batteries. Iron ore. Um, I don't think it'll stay. I, th- I think it dri- uh, dipped below a hundred um, dollars a ton uh, yesterday, maybe. Or I, I don't think it'll stay below a hundred very much, um, or, or for very long. Uh, you've got growing demand. Um, in places you didn't previously, specifically in batteries, I don't think that's going to make up for for China. But uh, y- you know, it, it's it, iron ore is basically always in demand. Um, so I just I'd, I'd be surprised if it stays below a hundred for very long. Um, okay. So anything battery related, I think natural gas, as I said, and then I think emerging markets in general, industrial firms within emerging markets, not a commodity that's bombed out, but perhaps a, a sector, if you will, that's overlooked and ignored. Okay. Let's talk about that just briefly. Explain that and, and maybe give us some examples of, of things that you would be considering or, or in fact you own. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the story with emerging markets, I think is, is that, uh, they've just sort of been overlooked or, or we haven't really been paying as much attention to them for the last couple of years. You know, they had a rough go of it during COVID, definitely rougher than the developed world. Uh, and then what you've got now, um, sort of post inflation, uh, they had a rough period there as well. And now what you've got is, is a lot of sort of catch up growth. And you also are seeing a lot of, uh, government flows, um, government capital, if you will, uh, going back into their economies. Every government sort of worldwide is spending money, building assets, building infrastructure, uh, supporting energy transition investments, et cetera. All of these, all of those sort of ideas, all of those themes, they all require uh, domestic industrial production capabilities. Um, and so companies that are producing cement in emerging markets, companies that are producing uh, uh, durable goods, industrial goods in um, emerging markets, plastics companies in emerging markets. Um, So anyone feeding into an industrial supply chain in emerging markets is is looking forward to to plenty of growth over the next couple of years. gotten some names at this point that I, I'd be really amped to share. But what I would say is that just anyone who is a potential beneficiary of government spending, feeding into infrastructure development, energy systems development, those are places you want to be for the next 10 years for sure. All right. We're going to have to wrap it up there. But Will, why don't you tell people where they can find out more about your firm your research, where they can sign up. You have some terrific stuff you publish. I highly recommend anybody who's interested in these things, uh, these 
resource and these materials and these industrials and emerging markets to put themselves on Will's list because it's some great, well-written stuff. Where do they find you? Yeah, well, so um, our website is uh, massifcap.com. That's M-A-S-S-I-F-C-A-P.com. Um, and you can sign up for our research subscriber uh, list right there. We share, um, you know, sort of a blog post every week, uh, although we've been a little uh, off that that pace recently and sort of quarterly letters and the occasional company report, things of that nature. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter at W. M. Thompson 22, I think is what my Twitter name is. <laughs> You're supposed to know this, Well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm, su- I'm supposed to know it. Um, I, Here, I, why I, don't we look? Don't yeah, go. Um, look it up and get it right because you don't want people going to the wrong one. Uh, WM, yeah, W. M. Thompson, T. H. O. M. S. O. N. 22. You were the 22nd guy. There's, yeah. It's not like you, you, you don't have a very unique name, do you? <laughs> Anyways, listen, you don't have a unique name, but you have unique ideas. And we always, what pleasure, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming, Will. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Take care. You too. Bye.